sense of it from a number of different passages. And so a good bit of what we're going to look at today comes from Matthew 13, Matthew 11, Matthew 10, and Matthew 12. So we're going to kind of jump between a few of those chapters. Now notice what it says here in Matthew 13, 34. It says, All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them. Now, there were certainly times when Jesus talked to the crowds in very plain talk, very plain speech. A great example might be, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount. But when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, it's very straightforward. Jesus gives lots of instructions. But then when you come to Matthew 13, he begins to speak in parables. And so the first half or so of uh, Matthew, he's pretty straightforward, but then something begins to shift. And it seems like he begins to speak in parables around the time that people began to reject him. And so in Matthew 10, 11, and 12, and then leading especially into 13, there's this building tension between Jesus and the Pharisees. And at that point, he begins to be more obscure in what he says. He gives these parables that are not nearly as clear as his earlier teaching. Now certainly there's still chapters after chapter 13 where he's talking to his disciples, for instance, or he's talking to a group of probably believers where he's a little bit more clear. But for the most part, when he's talking to crowds, as this verse says, he spoke in parables. And so that raises this big question. Why did Jesus teach in parables? What was it about parables that worked for what Jesus was trying to accomplish? Basically what I want to do is let this question guide us today. And so here is what the rest of that verse tells us. So all these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. There's something secretive that's been secretive for a very long time that Jesus is going to reveal in parables. This was the format that he chose to reveal secrets. And so the way I would put that is Jesus taught in parables to reveal heavenly secrets. But, I mean, we'd have to admit that's not the whole story because there are other reasons that the Bible tells us that Jesus spoke in parables. So something about parables is designed to reveal secrets, but there's more to it than that. It tells us, And his disciples came to him and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Interesting to me that the disciples are asking the same question that we're asking today. What happens is Jesus will give parables and people get confused, and then his disciples come to him and they ask this question. It happens on a few different occasions. He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So what we notice here is a you and a them. He kind of sets up this opposition. There's a you and there's a them. And I think what we would want to know is who is the you in this and who is the them? Well, we know who the you is because it's the disciples that have come to Jesus to ask this question, right? So we know that the you has got to be the disciples. The them in this is therefore the multitudes. Because remember what that first verse that we saw in verse 34 was, that he spoke to the multitudes in parables. So another word for that that's probably more common for us would be something like crowds. And so we have the disciples and the crowds. Now what he tells his disciples is that it's been given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom, but the crowds, it's not been given to them. They don't have that right. There is something about this situation where Jesus is teaching, where he wants his disciples to pick up on something, but he wants it to be hidden from the crowds. Now notice this in Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. So we're jumping back a, f- a few chapters, but this fits in to this concept of the you and the them and what they have access to. He says, Father, you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babies. I really love that because think of what Jesus was just saying. He says, to you it's been given, to the disciples it's been given for these things to be revealed. To the crowds, 
It's not been given to it for it to be revealed. So basically what he's saying in a sense, and I think it's in an ironic sense or maybe in a rhetorical sense, the crowds are wise. We might put it that way, sort of in quotes. They're wise, but you disciples are babies. You guys are infantile. You guys are childlike. And there's something about that that Jesus is really interested in, and that is apparently part of why he chose his disciples. Here's another that uh, Paul actually said in 1 Corinthians 1.12. He says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. If you're confounded, what are you? I I think a good uh, translation of that would be confused. And so what we gather from this is that God chose to reveal His secrets to those that the world might consider a little bit foolish to those that maybe are not the the most brilliant or the most academic, but then to the wise, he set it up in a way that the wise would be confused about some of the things that are taught by Jesus and by the apostles. It's a really interesting division that we see. And in fact, it seems like kind of the opposite of what we would expect. We would kind of expect for Jesus to show up and reveal his truths to the, uh, those that are at the very top of the, the hierarchy. Maybe he'd go to the universities and gather up all the PhDs and, and reveal his truths to them so they can teach others. That's not what he did. He chose what the world considers foolish to reveal those truths to. Here's another that's interesting to me. Unless you are converted and become like little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What's interesting about this to me is that he gives kind of these two aspects. One is entering the kingdom and the other is kingdom greatness. And he said for both of these, it requires a nature that is childlike. You want to get into the kingdom. It's a faith alone system. We know that from the Gospel of John and other places. And so you need to accept, you need to trust, you need to believe as a child does. Now here's the thing about my children. My children are a little leery about me, at least at least Eile is, because she's kind of caught on. I, I do a lot of sort of pretend things. But I could convince Eile of just about anything. I mean, I could. Now, a lot of times she'll say, Daddy, is that real? When I make some silly joke or something like that. But if I got real serious, I could convince her of just about anything because she's very accepting. She's very trusting. And I think this is what Jesus is getting at, is that he's looking for people that are trusting and accepting. Now, I wouldn't go so far as to say naive, uh, but this trusting concept, this innocence in the, in the sense that you can accept, that has to do with both entering the kingdom and being great in the kingdom. So here's what I would say. It seems to me that the disciples are trusting, they're innocent, and they're childlike. And the crowds are skeptical, self-righteous, and self-reliant. And in the crowds, what we notice is that among the crowds, among the multitudes, are the Pharisees, those people who are known for their own self-righteousness. In fact, in one of Jesus' parables that we looked at a number of months ago, it tells us that He spoke this parable to those who were relying on their own righteousness. So so there are these, these groups of people that are relying on their own righteousness. They're called the Pharisees, and those were the teachers that the crowds listened to. And so they were, in a sense, the disciples of the Pharisees. And here, I think, is what Jesus is saying parables do. Parables divide. Parables divide the trusting, the innocent, and the childlike from the skeptical, the self-righteous, and the self-reliant. I think those parables are designed to draw a stark line between those two groups, and it separates them. And that's exactly what we see with the disciples. So Jesus gives this parable to the multitude and to His disciples included, and what happens is they divide out. The multitudes say, "Eh, I don't get it, don't know, but maybe, uh, maybe He'll do a miracle for us, maybe He'll feed us. But what the disciples do is they divide themselves from the crowds, and they go to Jesus and they say, what is that all about? And so those who are trusting and innocent and childlike, it pulls them away from the crowds to get closer to Jesus because they want to understand. And this is what the parables do. And so ultimately, the parables counsel the trusting, the innocent, and the childlike, but the parables confuse the skeptical, the self-righteous, and the self-reliant. 
And it seems like it should be the exact opposite, right? It seems like the, those who are skeptical, those are self-reliant, those are self-righteous, the, the wise, as he calls it in one place, it seems like those would be the ones that get it. Those seem like they should be the ones that really understand, but it's those who are trusting and innocent and childlike that seek out that truth, that don't just reject what Jesus has to say. We already said that Jesus taught in parables to reveal heavenly secrets, but honestly, I think there's a lot more to it than that based on what we just saw. And so I would add this. I would say he revealed heavenly secrets to the trusting. I mean, that was his point. It is to reveal heavenly secrets, but it's to a specific group. It's not to just everybody. So it's to reveal heavenly secrets to the trusting. And then I would add this, but hide them from the self-righteous. It's almost as, he, as if he has this database of heavenly truths that he hides in plain sight. Because he speaks these parables publicly. He says this to crowds, and it's as if he's placing all of it in front of everybody. But there's an entire group that looks at it and says, oh, I don't know what that is. But then over here, there's a group that says, I think I get it. I think I understand. Because I've been with Jesus. Because I listen to what he says in the private moments. And so it's to reveal heavenly secrets to the trusting, but hide them from the self-righteous. Now, I would say even this is not the full purpose of parables. I think there's even a little bit more than that. So let's take a look at this scripture. It tells us this is continuing on in Matthew 13. So this is what follows. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now, if you look at that and say, I don't know what he is talking about, don't worry, you're in good company. This is one of those enigmatic statements that Jesus gives. This is one of those confusing things that he says, and I think we really have to uh, kind of analyze it. And so think about this line right here. He says, but whoever does not have. And we know that parables are about spiritual truths or about something heavenly. So in a spiritual sense, who is someone that absolutely has nothing in a spiritual sense? Unbelievers, yeah, unbelievers. So, but to whoever does not have, and I'm going to add, by the way, brackets mean it's not in the original verse. This is just my interpretation. So that's what brackets mean. I'm not trying to add to the verse. I'm just kind of trying to make it where we can understand it. So it seems like what he's saying here is, but whoever does not have eternal life, and then notice this next line, even what he has will be taken away from him. So for those who are unbelievers that do not have eternal life, what is it that they do have? What, what, what do we have if we don't have eternal life? What do we, what do we at least have? What's our basic level of, um, of possession? I would say it's our, our physical life because there are unbelievers that don't have eternal life, but they have a physical life and all the experiences and the status and all that comes along with that. And so I would add this life right here. So let's kind of read this. But whoever does not have eternal life, even what he has, this life, will be taken away from him. Now let's go back to the beginning and kind of think through this first line. He says, for whoever has. So in a spiritual sense, who is someone who has? It's believers, right? I mean, believers are those that have something, at least a basic sense they have something, and we would say it's eternal life that they have. So for whoever has eternal life, to him more will be given. Now can you get more of eternal life I'd say not, not really, but there are some verses that talk about having a greater experience in eternal life. In fact, this verse is one of them where it talks about abundance. You can have eternal life, but then you can have abundant eternal life or abundant physical life even here and now. So I would add, uh, I would add this to it. I would say reward now and in heaven. Well, we talk about reward a lot, and one of the things that we don't say a whole lot is that there is, it is rewarding in this life to obey and follow Christ. And so I, I believe there's reward now, but also in heaven, and I think that's what Jesus is talking about here. So let's read this Frankenstein verse now all together, and I'll, I'll show you what I think he's saying. For whoever has eternal life, to him more reward now and in heaven will be given and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have eternal life, even what he has, this life, will be taken away from him. So now when we read this, we got to remember that he is talking about the purpose for parables. I mean, the disciples just asked him, why do you speak in parables? And this is one of the things that he says in his answer. And so ultimately, what it seems like he's getting at is this. 
that the purpose of parables is to teach believers how to have abundant life. And that includes both reward, being rewarded now and in heaven. So let's just kind of read through this so far what we have. So Jesus taught in parables to reveal heavenly secrets to the trusting, but hide them from the self-righteous and to teach believers how to have an abundant life. Now, I actually think there's one more thing, and this one is a little bit more obscure, but it may be one of the most interesting to me. So let me show you what else Jesus says about all this. So at one point, Jesus had these crowds coming to him. He was doing miracles. He was healing. He was feeding people. And this is what he says. He says, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should cure them. Now, what's interesting here is Jesus is admitting that he is adding to the confusion of the crowds. Because if he spoke very plainly, if he overwhelmed their wits, it's possible that they would turn to God and they would be cured. Now, this is one of the most mysterious things, I think, that Jesus has to say. Jesus is basically saying, I know what I'm doing. I know that I'm confusing them because if I didn't confuse them, they might would turn and they would be healed, they would be cured. And he's not talking about physical healing here, I don't think. He's talking about spiritual healing. They would turn and they would change. And so we have this really kind of difficult question to answer. Why wouldn't God want the Jews to turn to Jesus and be cured? Why would he be obscure like this? Why would he, he speak in these mysterious phrases that make it difficult for people to understand and to believe? Why would he want to do that? He talks a little bit about this in a previous verse. He warned them not to make him known. Now you may say, well, who is the them here? So who's he talking to? So when he would, uh, earlier, when he would meet with a crowd and do miracles and heal and feed them, early in his ministry, he was telling them this. He was telling them, I, I don't want you to go out talking about me. I want you to keep this whole thing a secret. Notice what he says. He says he warned them. He's, he's not talking to just the disciples here. He's talking to the larger audience, the crowds, the multitude. He warned them not to make him known that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, Behold, my servant who I have chosen, he will declare justice to the Gentiles till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. That is a huge mystery because how many Gentiles did Jesus preach to? Anybody know? How many Gentiles did Jesus preach to? None that we know of. Now, he did minister to one lady that we're aware of in the area of Tyre and Sidon, one Gentile lady. And then he went to the Gennesaret at some point, and he may have interacted with some Gentiles. But as far as we know, he never declared a sermon or declared justice to Gentiles, at least not directly. But what that verse says is that he will declare justice to the Gentiles till in his name Gentiles will trust. Now, in his ministry... As far as we can tell, this didn't happen. But what Jesus is saying is that I don't want you to go out and talk about me because this, this prophecy needs to be fulfilled. This prophecy that the Gentiles need to come and believe in me. So let's go back to this question because this is our driving question right now. Why wouldn't God want the Jews to turn to Jesus and be cured? And it seems that it has something to do with the Gentiles. And maybe you begin to see where we're going with this. I think Paul helps us understand this idea. Notice what he says. He says, Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That is fascinating to me. And this blindness that he's talking about, he's not talking about physical blindness, of course. He's talking about a type of spiritual blindness. He's saying that spiritual blindness has happened to Israel for a while so that Gentiles could come in. And it seems to me that what Jesus was saying there is that there is some obscurity that he practiced so that it wouldn't be obvious, so that there would be Jews that reject him, and that would allow a time, a time period, while the Jews were rejecting him for the Gentiles to come in. And you may say, well, what is this Gentile thing about? What is that all about? It's about us. I mean, we are sitting here in this building, indirectly at least, because the Jews rejected their Messiah. Had the Jews accepted their Messiah in that moment when He came, the kingdom would have come. 
It was part of God's plan for the Jews to reject Him and then for us to go into this age where the church would be established and grow because there is a number of Gentiles that were willing to believe in the Messiah. And then at some point, that era is going to close. And then it tells us this, And so all Israel will be saved. So after this time of the Gentiles is done, after the church age is what we sometimes call it, after that's done, then Israel is going to turn back to their Messiah. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will, he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And so the answer to our question is, so we, or the question we're asking is, why wouldn't God want the Jews to turn to Jesus and be cured? He does, just not yet. And I know that's a strange idea, but it's because He loves the church, He loves Gentiles as well as Jews, that He allowed for this time where Israel would reject their Messiah and allow Gentiles to come in. And so I think we have to add to our list here. Jesus taught in parables for these reasons, to reveal heavenly secrets to the trusting, but hide them from the self-righteous, to teach believers how to have abundant life, and now we realize, and to intensify Israel's rejection for a while. Now notice I didn't say Jesus was forcing them to reject Him. Because if you look at the first chapters of Matthew, he's very straightforward. If you look at the, uh, the chapters that we find in the Gospel of John, he presents the message very clearly on many occasions. But then, after they begin to reject him, he begins to speak in parables. And so some might, might reject this and say, well, it's not fair that Jesus forced them to reject him. He didn't. What he did is he played upon their seed of rejection, knowing where it was going to go. And he intensified it. He hardened it. Some people have a similar uh, question about Pharaoh, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And some people say, well, that's not fair. Pharaoh should have had the opportunity to choose for himself whether he was going to obey God or not. But if you read through the story of Pharaoh and, and the uh, children of Israel, it actually tells us first that Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then later it tells us that God hardened his heart. And so God allowed him to make his decision, and then it was intensified by God. God wanted to accomplish something through that rejection. And so I don't see this as Jesus forcing the Jews to reject him, but he decided through God's plan to use the rejection that the Jews were going to experience, and he intensifies it. How? I think with parables, so that the Gentiles would have time to believe. Once they began to reject him, he spoke in parables, at least in part, to intensify, to solidify the fact that they would reject him. And that is why I believe he spoke in parables. Now, I want to transition to something that we, that's um, going to be a little bit different than what we've done. And I want to show you something that I've made. What I wanted to do is I wanted to take all of the parables and put them on one sheet and have this reference to all of the parables that make sense of it. I'm going to go through what's on this to kind of help us make sense of it. In the top corner here, I have made a web page where all of the sermon videos that we've done so far are there. And so like if you if this is something that you want to try to help your friends understand the parables, that's a pretty good place to go because it's got what we've done so far. And then below that, we begin we get into the uh, the categories. And I'll talk about the categories in a minute, but basically I've rearranged uh, these. This is not the order that we taught them in. It's also not the order that they appear in the Bible. This is an order that I've sort of devised because I've tried to group them together based on a certain criteria, and I'll explain that in a minute. And so as we go through, then we have a group that we're, we're calling life change parables. Then we've got a group that we're calling character revealed parables. We've got a group that we're calling salvation or condemnation parables. And then we've got a group that we're calling salvation only. And uh, by the way, the, those are on the back. It's, there's uh, some on the back as well. And then we've got general principles, which you might glance at and think, well, those are apparently different altogether. And then at the very bottom, we've got all the biblical references because you may want to know where they appear in the Bible. You may want to read them for yourselves. That's where you can find that. Let's take a look at what the top of the column is and try to make sense of this because there's a number of squares. What you see on the left there uh, is the parables and illustrations. You may say, well, now why, why is it parables and illustrations? 
the reason why I said illustrations is because some of these uh, parables um, are so short that they're almost just an illustration. They're almost just a, a, like an object lesson that Jesus uses to make a point. And what we've already said about parables and what Jesus said about parables is parables are usually confusing to the self-righteous and the self-reliant. But some of these illustrations that he uses are not really all that difficult to understand. They're very simple and they're illustrating some simple point. And so there's some on this list that I think probably could fall into the category of illustrations rather Rather than the category of parables. And so then you'll notice uh, to the right of that, you notice two main categories that are not saved and eternally saved. And that is a dividing line that we find in some parables, that there are those characters who are not saved and that those that are saved. And then below that, you've got unbeliever, you've got failed disciple, and you've got successful disciple. And that is really the unique thing about this chart, is many people, when they look at the parables, they don't, they don't distinguish between failed disciple and successful disciple. But I actually think that is a lot of what Jesus was trying to teach, that there are those who are failed disciples but are eternally saved. So let's look at some of the categories that we have here. The first three I think are the most important for understanding the rest of the parables. And you'll notice that we have had a sermon on each of these because I think they're so important. The, and I'm calling this category the full spectrum parables because what you'll notice is that there are characters in all of the categories. There's characters in the unbelieving category, there's characters in the failed disciple category, and the successful disciple category. That's what makes these unique. None of the other parables have characters in every single category. And so what this does is this helps us understand the categories. It helps us understand these different characters that are going to show up in other parables. And so if you were ever going to do a Bible study with your friends, for instance, about the parables, I would suggest starting with these three. And then we have life change parables. And the unique thing about this category is you'll see little arrows between the failed disciple and the successful disciple. And the reason why there's arrows there is because you're not looking at two different characters. You're looking at one character who is a failed disciple at one point in their life and then a successful disciple in another point of their life. And so at one point in their experience, they're not doing well spiritually. And at another point, they're doing very well. And so you notice the different characters, the watchful servant, the ready resident, the wise servant, the found sheep, the found coin, the found son, all of those are the same person as the, uh, the failed disciple category, the sleeping servant, the unready uh, resident, and so on and so forth. So you're really looking at one character who at different points in his experience or her experience is failing or succeeding. The next category is what I'm calling character revealed. And this is very similar to the last category, except that in these, Jesus gives different characters to represent the failed disciple and the successful disciple. And so in these, what you'll find is it's like the older brother and the father, and they are an example of two different characters that represent different status. Now, I've done something unique here that maybe some people won't like. I've divided the prodigal son parable right down the middle. And I'm not saying it's two, uh, it's two parables. It's one parable, but I think there's two lessons in it. And so I think what Jesus is illustrating in the prodigal son is both that the lost son can become the found son, but I think he's also illustrating that the father is a good example of spiritual leadership and the older brother is not. And so I think there's two lessons in there, and that's why it's on uh, two different uh, uh, lines. And then we've got salvation or condemnation. In this, it's unique because there doesn't seem to be a difference. Yeah, this is on the back side. There doesn't seem to be a difference between the failed disciple and successful disciple. He is, seems to be just teaching the difference between those who are, are not saved and those who are saved. And then salvation only uh, parables. These are another that are a little bit different, difficult to categorize because in these, Jesus talks about the mustard seed, the leaven, the treasure, the pearl, uh, and then debtors and seed. Now, what I'm not saying, I'm not saying that the mustard seed represents one believer. The mustard seed represents the kingdom, and the kingdom is 
believers. I mean, it's other stuff too, but it is believers. So that's, that's the same with the leaven, the treasure, the pearl. We're saying it's believers as a whole, not one believer. And then the last category that I think is maybe surprising is what I'm calling general principle parables. And in these, I don't think they are about who's saved, who's not saved, who's a good disciple, who's a bad disciple. I think he's teaching a specific principle. He's teaching an idea. So let's just think through them quickly. The budding fig tree, that's about reading the signs of the times. It's not about who's saved or not saved. The rich fool, now you could say, is the rich fool saved or is he not saved? You could say, well, technically he could be either. The principle is you need to understand that God's got a plan and you're not God. Uh, the Good Samaritan. People would say, well, I think the Good Samaritan was saved. And I would say, yeah, he might be. Or maybe not. Maybe that's just not the point of the parable. It seems that Jesus is just teaching a principle about who is your neighbor. Because that's the question that leads off the Good Samaritan. This lawyer comes to him and says, yeah, but who's my neighbor? And then he teaches this. That's what he's doing. He's just answering that question. And then the new wineskins, once again, that's about the old system is not going to quite fit with the new system. And so these, I don't think, are about who's saved or who's not saved. And you can see why that would really matter. Because if if you thought that the Good Samaritan, for instance, was telling you how to get saved, then we would all probably be in trouble because none of us really live up to, I'm guessing, that Good Samaritan. So those are our categories and that is that sheet.